Welcome to Prophecy USA Bible Study, everyone. My name is Rick Pearson, and this is a Bible study specifically designed to unveil America's role in Bible prophecy. I have with me today my wife, Karen. I'm so glad to be here today, and uh, we're going to be talking about preparing for the coming Exodus. So get ready for this podcast. Preparing for the coming Exodus. Before we do that, uh, last week we talked about um, receiving mail from everyone and how much it encourages mm. us. And we just want to read one letter uh, before we start from someone who has uh, told us that our ministry has, has meant so much to them. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a really nice letter. Uh, Dear Rick Pearson, following your Sunday night broadcast faithfully on TCT, and I'm greatly impressed with your scriptural basis for your prophecy. Good. I always felt America was in the last time's prophecy, but mistrusted efforts to identify it with obscure force fit efforts. I never saw Lady Liberty as representing the U.S., but she does, and certainly did not want to see her as the whore of Babylon, but cannot pretend it isn't so. Please find and close my donation, and I would like to obtain whatever print books you have on this insight you have. I've heard you mention the hour and the soon-to-be-out exodus, and I'd like to get these and whatever else is available. I appreciate the dedication and hard work you've done to present this to the world. The scriptural foundation for me is key to the credibility of your position. May God bless you. Sincerely, Jeanette. Jeanette, thank you so much. And we want to emphasize something. Karen's from America. She's an American, and I'm a Canadian. And we want everyone to know that we love America and we love Canada. We love our heritage. We're not down on anything about our country, but our countries have changed. America was a lady of kingdoms. She still is a lady of kingdoms, but she has turned her back on God. And uh, she has kicked God out of the schools, out of the government, and Canada's done the same thing. And there's heavy repercussions coming because of that. But the Bible says to come out of her, my people, be not partaker of her sins, nor of her plagues. So we believe that something very good is coming by the hand of God in the future. And uh, last week we explained with the with if you're listening to the news, we're listening to the news every day, and I'm watching the news, and we're researching books, and of course this is the number one book that we stand on at Prophecy USA, and we're listening to various ministries, who are are preaching the gospel, and seeing if our word is lining up with them, and. Uh, Recently in Italy, they just had an election and a right-wing conservative president, uh, Giorgi Maloney, Maloney, Maloney uh, was elected as the new prime minister. And according to her platform, she stands for God, family, and country. However, the Washington Post and the left-wing leading uh, journalists have made this statement, Italy election results set up first far-right government since Mussolini. They're comparing wow. this woman to Mussolini because she believes in a, having a sovereign nation. Now, NPR, which is a U.S. Uh, public, radio. public radio, said what is important in the campaign is not the policy itself, it's the message. We will stop them at any cost, says historian Lorenzo Castello, a professor at Rome's Louis University. Maloney is proposing herself as a sort of defender of the borders, a very Trumpian approach <laughs> from this point of view. Castellani says, referring to former President Donald Trump's anti-immigration rhetoric and policies. Now, According to the BBC, the British uh, Broadcasting, Broadcasting Corporation, Maloney says yes to the natural family and no to the G LGBT lobby. She says yes to sexual identity, but no to gender ideology. 
She says no to Islamic violence, but yes to secure bar borders. She says no to mass migration and no to big international finance. Now Fox News and Newsmax and the right-wing conservatives are applauding her for what she's standing up mm -hmm. to, with. But CNN, MSNBC, ABC, and the CBC here in Canada are showing pictures of fascist um, parades with Mussolini and Hitler and, and people raising their hands because they're nationalists. Well, Mussolini and Hitler were fascists, but they don't stand up for the same things that this woman stood up for. Correct. The Atlantic Journal said this, Maloney's enemies list is familiar. LGBT lobbies that are out to harm women and the family by destroying gender identity. George Soros, an international speculator, and she has said who finances, Maloney has said that he finances global mass immigration that threatens a great replacement of white native born in Italians. Now she's absolutely right. George Soros is the man who comes up with a world without borders. George Soros is also the man who wants a one world government. He's the man who is financing the most violent subgroups within our um, culture. He finances at Antifa and the violence that he's supporting is of a fascist nature. Last Thursday, a Canadian Christian College where I received a honorary doctorate of laws degree uh, in 2017, they had the Democracy Fund uh, Summit. And that, that summit included Conrad Black and Rex Murphy. Now, Conrad Black uh, was the founder of the National Post in Canada, and Rex Murphy is one of his journalists. And they concluded the summit by saying journalism is dead in North America and has become a partisan-driven propaganda machine. The left, according to them, is everything they accuse others of being. These um, journalists and news networks are not reporting the truth, but they're reporting things biasly against anyone who goes against their policies. So an, an honest journalist, whether he likes a person or doesn't like them, whether he votes for them or he doesn't vote for them, reports the truth. If somebody lies, they report it. If somebody's corrupt, they report it, whether they're for or against the person. So the left is guilty of being dictators, fascists, corrupt, and dishonest, according to two men who have been in journalism combined for over a hundred years. Mm. Meanwhile, as we're watching all this unfold around the world, Europe is going into a dark winter. Energy in France is up 700%. The bills right. for, for energy. Germany is cutting down forests so they can have wood. Trump warned them three years ago at the UN speech that they were too dependent on Russia, in which case everyone laughed at Trump. And today what he warned them of is coming to pass, not because Donald Trump is a fascist, but Donald Trump is a, is a businessman who spent his whole life looking at the market and trying to decide which way things were going and this is the same way I live my life uh, in business, trying to be practical and see which way the market's going, which way the trends are going, the demographics. He never made his career in politics. He made his career in making right decisions. And right now, everything that the World Economic Forum has promised us is going absolutely sideways. Ukraine 
the food source for Europe um, is going to cause food shortages in Europe. All of North America is now warning us of food shortages. Meanwhile, in Canada, the left-wing Mr. Trudeau wants to cut fertilizer. People are going to starve in Africa and where the food baskets of the nation are, like in Netherlands and in Canada, these World Economic Forum fascists want to cut the fertilizer and create more starvation. This is what fascism is all about. And most of these changes are due to the United Nations agenda, agenda for global sustainability. Now, uh, we have talked about this before in the past and in, in different um, uh, podcasts, but a year and a half ago when we wrote our book, The Hour That Changes Everything, we explained over a year and a half ago the World Economic Forum and what the globalist, globalists want to do. They think they are going to create a utopia around the world, a utopia without God, a government without God. And utopia means a place, state, or condition that is ideally perfect in respect of politics, laws, customs, and conditions. But actually, what fascism does is it creates a dystopia. Dystopia means bureaucratic control, meaning a government with relentless regulations and rules. It means corporate control, where large corporations control people through media or products. It also means a philosophical religious control, where an ideology is enforced by the government and they control society. Now, the definition of fascism is a way of organizing a society in which a government ruled by a dictator controls the lives of the people in which people are not allowed to disagree with the government. In other words, they control the speech, they control the media, the media and, and the newspapers are in bed and they are just talking heads of what the government tells them to say. <clears throat> Today, we have a clash in the world. We have a clash of globalists who do not want God. They do not want this Bible. They do not want the Ten Commandments. And the world is totally out of control because of their agendas and what they are creating in the world with a world without God. So there's a clash coming. Now, the thing is, how do we prepare for what's coming? Well, guess what? This book, the Bible, calls the end from the beginning. We already know what's coming. Prophecy USA has been trumpeting the warning for the last three years, not what we say, but what this Bible says. Exactly. And we know what's coming. There is coming a day when there is going to be a dystopia. God is going to hand the planet over to these people and Satan for a period of seven years. Jesus Christ of Nazareth said that it will be the worst time in the history of the world to live. In the meantime, we who are Christians and follow this book to the best of our ability are supposed to stand up and raise a shout and warn others. So um, what do we do to prepare for what is coming? Now we're talking about macro events. When I say macro, I mean global. I can't control the stock market. We can't control elections. We've got a little home here with a, me and Karen and our little dog. What do we do on a, on a personal basis? What can we do? We can vote, but we can't control anything. So we have a question now from a, uh, of, uh, one of our partners, and she basically asked the question that's gonna put uh, a foundation for our teaching today in 
preparing for the coming exodus, preparing for what's coming in the future. Karen, who, who is that from? Can we read it? This is from Jane. I listen to your podcast and your TV programs, as well as other ministries programs. Everyone is in agreement that we are getting close to the end times. However, I do not hear anyone teaching that America is Babylon the Great. How can you justify being the only one out there saying America is in the Bible while absolutely nobody else is teaching this? <laughs> That's a good question. It is. That's a very good question. We are a lone voice right now in the body of Christ. And there's a lot of people that don't agree with us, but they won't send us scriptures to tell us and or, or show us why. There's a, there's a saying that timing is everything. And when you listen to others teach prophecy, I want you to ask this question. Does it make any sense that America is not in Scripture? Does it make any sense that the latter-day nation that they say has a covenant with God, the richest, most powerful nation in the history of the earth, in the end times, is not in Scripture? Does it make sense that the latter-day nation of Babylon has 53 biblical descriptions that's in this book, and America meets every one. Does it make any sense that these are not my descriptions, Rick Pearson, but they come from Isaiah, Moses, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, and John, who declares the end from the beginning and who are bona fide prophets according to Scripture. And yet, nobody is talking about what these prophets described. And we had one listener who said, I love your program, but so-and-so says that you're wrong. Now, this is a, this is a, um, a, a person who, who has listened to our teaching, and they loved it, and they said, wow, I, I didn't know that America was in the Bible. And he went to his friend, who is a teacher on television, who also teaches prophecy. And this particular man said, well, Prophecy USA is totally wrong. I don't agree with them. And, and this particular teacher teaches about the lives of the prophets, the ministry of the prophets, and he is convinced that Israel is the key player in Bible prophecy. And he's totally correct. Yes, We are in 100% agreement that the geographical center of the earth, is, according to God, is the city of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. It's Mount Zion. It's where Jesus will come back. So in that sense, we're 100% in agreement. But the prophets that we both teach about, while they were on earth, they warned Israel and Judah of judgment. They warn them that Baal worship will destroy a covenant nation if you keep doing this. They warn the nation uh, about the shedding of innocent blood. And at the time of their prophesying, other prophets denounced them. They said God is not going to judge Israel. He's not going to judge Judah. And eventually, those men in the Bible that we quote were stoned to death. They were boiled in oil. Um, sawn asunder. Isaiah was sawn asunder. And we're quoting all of those prophets today. We never made up the 53 descriptions of American Bible prophecy. We're just quoting what they said it would look like. So today... Prophecy USA quotes every one of those prophets, and we give America the same warnings that these prophets gave Israel because we're fighting the same demons that they fought because the same spirits that were over there defiling a covenant nation of Israel and Judah are the same demons that are here today affecting our culture. 
but we also serve the same God that those prophets served. And it's the same battle that we fight trying to convince America if she does not come back to God, God is going to judge her. Now, according to scripture, the 53 descriptions of America have all been fulfilled, or, or Babylon the Great have all been fulfilled. The 54th description is her judgment, and it's eight verses. In one hour, she's judged by fire, fire, and that's the title of our book, The Hour That Changes Everything. It's not a feel good, nothing to see here, folks. It's all gonna happen over there kind of message. No. And a lot of people on television and preaching prophecy they, they would rather embrace this greasy, gracy, sloppy, agape message that you can do anything you want and God won't respond. Uh, we're, we're okay over here. It's all going to happen over there. We believe that they are 100% wrong, but they won't touch it with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> and that's our calling. And we will not back down. I will not back down until somebody can show me in scripture that I'm wrong and I've had no takers yet. Now we've had some people call us and throw some things at us, but when I ask them how come America fulfills 53 biblical descriptions in prophecy, these people don't even know what the descriptions are. And they don't want to read them either. And they don't want to read them. <laughs> so um, these, these folks teaching prophecy today and warning about the second coming and the, the rapture, they all love God. We all love God. We're serving him to the best of our ability. But for some reason, their eyes have not been opened to see what we've been shown. But Galatians 6, 7 says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now that message is not only for us personally, but it's for the nations, especially a covenant nation. If you sow to the flesh, you will reap of the flesh. If you sow to the Spirit, as in Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14, God will bless a nation who walks after his covenant mandates. But if you walk away from those mandates, you're walking away from God and from his blessings, and you've opened yourself up to principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness, and you've broken the hedge of protection around you, either on a personal basis or on a national basis. Now, verse 10 of that verse says, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. God made a covenant with Israel, but the pilgrims made a covenant with God. Yes. In 1620, when they dedicated the land, Israel broke covenant with God, and Jesus addressed the problem with the teachers in the land. In Luke 11, it reads this, Woe unto you, you lawyers, you teachers, you rabbis, you teachers of the word, for ye laid men with burdens grievous to be born, and ye yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe unto you, for ye build the sepulchres of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. Now these teachers quoted the prophets, the same ones I'm quoting, but then refuse to acknowledge in their day and generation the consequences of not following their teachings. Mm. And Jesus rebuked them. He said, truly you bear witness that ye allow the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, the prophets, and you build their sepulchers. Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute. This is what happened in the Old Testament when these prophets were warning people of judgment that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. 
the prophet's words were not for other generation, were not just for their generation. Mm -hmm. It was for this generation. Those prophetic words they spoke. You can read all the things that happened then and there and talk about it as a history teacher, but you have to apply them in our generation. You have to apply them to our day-to-day -day life. You have to apply them. If there's a covenant nation in the last days called Babylon the Great, and she has 53 descriptions, and she appears before the Antichrist comes, you have to address what they said. And if you're going to get a little controversy, because you're going to have the same controversy that the lawyers gave Jesus Christ. Woe unto you, lawyers, if, verse 52, for you've taken away the key of knowledge. You entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in, you hindered. They didn't warn the people. Right. Jesus was warning the people during his day, and 40 years later, Rome came and dismantled the whole nation of Israel. Jesus prophesied it. But the lawyers and the teachers would not address the sins at the time. They wouldn't come to Jesus. So this is a parallel of what I believe is happening today. Um, a prophet's mandate is given by Ezekiel. Ezekiel 33, 8 and 9. When I say unto you the, to the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Um, I'm just going to plug this in before it goes out, so I don't lose it. Excuse me. There we go. Just had a warning come on. <laughs> um, nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Now, folks, we're in a nation right now, and you're watching it on television. You are watching the wickedness. You are watching what's happening. And this book says if you get into this book, it will give you discernment to know between good and evil. Traditional theology teachers will never embrace America's role in Bible prophecy, period. They will not do that. Not until her judgment falls, or God warns us with his hand of warning, which is what we are praying for and is fully explained in our next book, The Coming Exodus, that God is going to warn us with signs and wonders. Jesus came, a man of God, approved of God, by the Holy Ghost, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Jesus cut through the legal, traditional theology of his day, and God anointed him to do that because what the old prophet said, Jesus was fulfilling. Over 300 prophecies he's fulfilled, and the traditional prophecy teachers were walking around talking about the prophets, and they couldn't even see prophecy being fulfilled right under their noses. So folks, I'm not saying that they're bad people, but I'm saying that we are not into traditional theology. Prophecy USA is talking not about history in the past, we're looking into the future. And we know that Israel was judged for her Baal worship and the shedding of innocent blood and the United States of America has an opportunity to come back to God, but according to Scripture, there will be a remnant that comes back, come out of her, my people, be not partaker of her sins, nor in her plagues. We, we're believing there's going to be a move of God to pull the harvest in, and it's going to separate the wheat and the chaff, and then the hour of judgment will fall. Oh. And we're praying for God to move in this great nation. Um, many people will quote you the prophets then and there, but they have no revelation of the here and now. They teach Bible stories what happened then and there, 
but they don't have the intestinal fortitude to warn people here and now that it can all happen again to us nationally and personally if we don't obey the scripture. And the churches in America are steeped in this traditional mindset. They have no clue that America is in scripture and don't even try to tell them. Why not? Because they cannot accept her last day in power. They cannot see her as the seventh nation of eight providential nations in scripture. And some of them don't even know there's eight providential nations in scripture. They've never heard it before. So Karen, you have now another question and this fits right into our teaching today. Yes. So this letter came in. It says, thank you, Rick and Karen, for your podcasts and TV program. I find myself listening to the news and getting to a point where I'm anxious and worried. Your teaching comforts me knowing that we're in the last days and that America is just fulfilling scripture. For an average person like me, what should I be doing to prepare myself to make sure I'm found worthy to escape the coming hour that changes everything? Okay. Uh, she says that she's anxious mm -hmm. and she's afraid mm -hmm. because she's listening to the news. Excuse yes. me. <clears throat> totally understand what she's saying. First, don't stop listening to the news. Instead, be a watchman and discern the signs of the times just like the sons of Issachar. I just listened three minutes ago to the news and I heard the President of the United States calling everybody a fascist and a dictator if you if you followed after um, the Republican Party or or the mega crowd and and keep in mind folks I am I'm a Canadian I don't vote either way Democrat or I don't do that but I look at policies around the world I look at this woman in Italy I don't vote for her. I look at the policies in Canada. I do get to vote in Canada. I look at the policies in America. But there is a global agenda taking place. And you need to discern the signs of the times. And in my next book, The Coming Exodus, I want you to remember that God's in total control. Baal worship is rampant now. And before the main exodus took place, God sent Moses to the Red Sea for a reason. We're going to talk about that shortly. But you do not have to be afraid of what's coming, but you need to be aware so you can prepare yourself for what's coming. Yes. And he will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Now is the time where you can be a watchman and you can affect people's lives because you have a divine revelation knowledge when you get into scripture and you know what's coming you can warn others and sometimes that doesn't mean you go and start teaching them the bible but you 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 try and work on yourself to become more like jesus and people will be drawn to you when they see jesus now, in Exodus 14, and this is something I just learned today from one of the prophetic seminars that I was listening to, and what these men said struck a chord in my heart. And um, they quoted Exodus 14, and the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they turn and encamp before uh, Fihereth, between Midgal and the sea, over against Balaam Zephon. Now, this is after Moses had nine mighty miracles, and the last, the ninth one was Pharaoh and the firstborn, his child, and all the firstborn in Egypt died, and Pharaoh said, that's it, I'm not fighting your God anymore. Let the people go. And he gave them riches and rubies and said, just get out of my country. And God said, I want you to go to the Red Sea, and I want you to park at Mid Migdal over against Baal Zephon. 
Baal Zephon is the worshiping place where they worship Baal. Mm. It's the place where the e Egyptians and the different people um, worship Baal, Zephon, which was um, a god of riches, and of course, all of the immorality that Baal worship produces, and of course, child sacrifice. And Egypt had been sacrificing the firstborn by drowning him in the water, and then they wanted to be blessed by Baal Zephon, and that's what they were doing. If they sacrificed the children, they could be blessed by this demonic spirit called Baal. And God says, I want you to go park right there. So Moses and the two million children went to Baal Zephon, and God said, for Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants were turned against the, the, Egypt, the Israelites, and they said, why have we let them go? That we have let Israel go from serving us. He was a fascist, dictatorial dictator. He was treating people like slaves. They did what he said or he'd kill them. And so Pharaoh made ready his chariots and he took with his people 600 chariots and they went to that place and the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh of Egypt and he pursued them after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a high hand, but the Egyptians pursued after them with all their horses and their chariots, and they overtook them before Baal Zephon. Now, Baal has invaded our land in North America. Okay. It's the same demonic <clears throat> stronghold spirit, Baal worship. It's here now. It's, he's a fallen angel, and some people would laugh at that. It doesn't matter. We, we, we fight against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in high places. And God said to Babylon, uh, get thee into darkness. You will become the habitation of every foul and unclean spirit and the hold of every hateful bird. That is one of the 53 descriptions of this lady of kingdoms we love so much, and she fills her cup with the shedding of innocent blood, and it's all from Baal worship. Now, in verse 10, it says, And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore thou hast dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, Moses, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it's better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Now listen, folks, they were afraid, <laughs> they were negative, they were complaining, they were cowardly. But God put them in a position where God was getting ready to show forth his power of deliverance. And so Moses said unto the people, Fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he shall show you to the, today. For the Egyptians, for the fascists, for the government that's trying to destroy you, whom you've seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, mm. and you shall hold your peace. God is going to fight for us. We cannot control what's happening, but God is on the scene, and he's in total control, because these folks that we're watching on the news and the news pundits are all falling into God's hand to fulfill this book. And the Lord said unto Moses, 
why are you crying unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward, lift up thy rod, stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea, and I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh, and upon all his hosts, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the angel of God went before the camp of Israel and with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, and, it's, and he stood behind them. God has got our back from mm, That's good. Bible prophecy is being fulfilled <laughs> not from 2,000 years ago, teaching history. Right now, today, God's going to do some things in the future. He's going to fulfill this book, and you want to be on top of what's going on. Don't be afraid of what's happening. God is placing all the dominoes in place. He's letting the free will of man fulfill what he said they would do once they leave him. And America has left God, but there is a remnant within America that God says, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. And they're trying to do harm to the church and God is watching. We are standing before Baal and Baal's rising up just like Goliath did in the valley for 40 days and 40 nights. He mocked, scoffed, and ridiculed the nation of Israel and the God of Israel. Until the 40th night, God looked down and he said, David, go out there and take his head off. <laughs> and little David, among the laughing, the mocking, the scoffing, went out there and in split second timing, he dropped Goliath to his knees. He wasn't afraid. He wasn't afraid because he knew God was with him. Amen. And God is with you, folks. God is with you. He's with us. So what do we do to prepare for what's coming? Number one, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid as you watch this. This is, this is from generation to generation to generation. The devil has always hated the Jews and he hates the Christians. So you walk into a room and people don't like you for no reason at all. Well, there's something inside of them that doesn't like what's inside of you. But our goal is not to return the favor. <laughs> Our goal is to love them even though they don't like us. We know stuff that they don't know. And even the Christians that are teaching the Bible don't have a clue and don't, don't even try and tell some of them. They're so steeped like the lawyers. The son of the living God was standing in front of them. The word became flesh and dwelt among them and they... They were so steeped in their traditional mindset. Israel's a covenant nation. Jesus said, God's going to destroy it. No, no, this man's wrong. He's a false prophet. Even with signs and wonders, Jesus couldn't convince them. Now we know, and, and we all know, that they had to fulfill Bible prophecy because if if they had not crucified Jesus, we would not have a way to salvation. So God allowed that to happen. Mm -hmm. And he's going to allow things to happen in the nation that we may not like, but don't worry. We're going to get through it because God is going to show up on the scene, on the scene. So the first thing you have to do, what do we do to get you know, on, on a macro scale, this, this stuff that's happening, it, it's, you can't do anything. 
You can't, you can't tell, you can't control who's getting voted in Israel. You can't control what the World Economic Forum's doing. You can't control what the United Nations agenda. These people are far gone into darkness. You can't control some of the culture in our nation. The only thing you can do is get this book inside you and do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Do not be weary in well-doing. You will reap if you faint not. Ephesians 4.24 says, Put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Neither give place to the devil. Don't let him worry you. Don't let his thoughts cause you to be anxious. Let him that stole steal no more. But let him labor, working with his hand, the thing which is good. What has God put into your hands that you can work a good thing with? Mm. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. So what can I do? It says in verse 32, be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Think about the people that you are closest to. Who are the people that you're closest to? Be ye kind one to another. Be tender-hearted. Be forgiving. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. The only thing you have control of is yourself. That's all that God requires of you, is to control yourself. In Exodus 20, 12, it says, Honor thy father and thy mother, this is part of the Ten Commandments, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And of course, then it says, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not bear false witness. There's a lot of people on television today bearing false witness. God is going to judge that. Now, on a personal basis, uh, several years ago, five years ago, uh, my dad passed away. Mm -hmm. And Karen, you remember that. And before my dad died, I asked him if there's anything he'd like to say to me. You remember this? I do. <laughs> and my dad says, no, nothing I want to say. I said, well, is, don't you have anything you want to say? And my dad said, well, usually you say that to the person that's dying, Rick. So I went for 15 minutes and I told my dad what a great man he was. He was a great father. He was, he was a wonderful man. He was not perfect. I worked with my dad for 32 years. And we had, you know, we, we locked horns. Uh, we had differences of opinion, but we always worked it out. And you always honored him. And I always honored him. And here he is at the end of his life. And I said, well, is is I, 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 I said all these nice superlative things to build him up. And I said, now, is there anything you'd like to say to me? And he said, no. <laughs> and I was wanting my dad to throw me a bone and tell me that I was a great son and I worked good and I was, you know, um, honorable of integrity. Or, or he was proud of me, but he just couldn't say anything. And it really aggravated me. I said, well, can you just say one good thing that you like about me, Dad? And he says, yeah. He says, I like your wife. And then he laughed. Do you remember that? Yes. Now, there was something inside of me. And I thought, can't you just say one good thing to me, Dad? But I remembered that verse that said, honor thy father and thy mother and I looked at my father who had a grade eight education, who was very smart, but there was a certain thing about him that he was not ex excited about our success, my success, and maybe he was a little jealous or something, but there was something there not right, but I had to forgive him. So when he was passing away, I went 
and I asked the Lord, please let me be with my dad when he passes. And I forgave him. And I held his hand and I read the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And when I came to the part that said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, my dad started to shake. And I said, dad, don't be afraid. I promise you, dad, I'm going to take good care of mom. She's not going to have to worry about one thing. And I promise you that. And at that point, my dad took his last breath, he relaxed, and up he went. And, I, and it was such a blessing. Five years later, well, anyway, what, what we did was um, my mother uh, lived in the house by herself, and when we went to Florida, I said to her, why don't we put you in a... Uh, a care Why don't you move to an assisted living facility? Assisted living for the winter, and then you can come back in she the summer. She wouldn't have to drive in the snow. Yeah, and then she doesn't have to drive in the snow and all that, and she thought that was a great she idea. She was in her 90s. She was, yeah, she's 94. Mm -hmm. And um, so before she got into that room, uh, I asked her what her favorite colors were. And we, we found a room that she liked, and we went back home. And then when she was at home, we painted that room her favorite colors. We put up the curtains that she liked. <laughs> we put in California shutters. We bought, I, I went out and bought a, a, a fi electric fireplace and a little TV. And then I bought a, um, an iPad, and I hooked it all up so that I could call my mother every day and just say hi. And a little and, fridge. And, and we had a little fridge. And, and I took chair. the pictures of the family up on the wall. And she went into that retirement home, assisted living. And we called her every day. And we would be at Karen's horse. And we'd call her and say, hey, Mom, we're at, we're at, we're at the farm. And she saw the horses. And then we were down south in Florida. And I'd call her on the beach on my phone. Say, hey, mom, we're taking Cody for a swim. And she would sit <laughs> up in Canada. And the woman at the uh, assisted living said to me, she says, you have no idea how many people in this place sit and they wait for weeks for their sons or their daughters to call them. And I was, and, and this woman said, it is so wonderful how you've set this up for your mother. And my mother, the last five years of her life, was so happy and she was so delighted and she didn't even want to go back home. No, she decided to stay. So then she, she, um, her, her, she was 99 and she had a heart attack. She was at about 30%. And... She said to me, Rick, I, I don't want to live anymore. I am tired of this body. And I said, okay. Um, she said, I think I'm going to die in the next day or two. And she was up and down. And I said, well, I said, um, when you get to heaven, mom. And she said to me, she said, you know, Rick, you have a twin sister up in heaven that I've never seen. And you have an older brother. And I want to go and I want to be with dad. And I said, okay. Um, I said, now when you get up there, you tell dad, was I good to you? And she started laughing. She says, Rick, you were the best. She says, you were the best. You took such good care of me. And that made me feel wonderful. Yes. And then the next day we went, she went into a coma and we read the same 23rd verse. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie in green pastures. He restoreth my soul. And then the, the heart monitor went blank, flatlined, yeah. and mom went. But the last thing my mother said to me the night before, she says, Rick, I'm going to go be with the Lord, and don't you worry about me, but... Um, I'm going to go see your sister and your brother. So this is the last time you're going to see me. So bye-bye. I love you. She I love you. I love you, Rick. Now, folks, you can't, you can't pay to have that. 
But you know what? I decided I only have one mother. I only have one mother. I'm going to be the best I can be to my mother and honor her. You might have one or two sons. They're the only sons you're going to have. You have a husband, a wife. Be the best, the kindest to those folks because you're either going to bury them or they're going to bury you or we're going to be raptured. And Jesus said for men to treat your wife as, as, as Jesus treats the church. So what can we do with all the mess that's going on is you have to look and see what's going on because you have to be a watchman. But you don't have to let the mess get into you and into the anxiety of your life. Just live your life and be kind one to another and everywhere you go is your ministry. Everywhere you go is your ministry. And I was in the airport once and a guy came in in his jet. I think we shared this before. Uh, A man came in in his jet and he was very rich, I could tell. And he was very unhappy about the service that he had. And there was a young girl at the counter, 20 years old. And uh, he just rang her through the gears. He says, this is the worst FBO I've ever been. It's so unorganized. And this poor girl, the phones were ringing. People were coming up to the desk. Mm-hmm. She was getting other airplanes scheduled for fuel. And, and other people were coming in with her baggage. And I could tell she was just overwhelmed with the workload. Mm-hmm. And that man just bawled her out like crazy. And I looked at her and I saw the pain in her eyes. She was just about ready to start crying. And he left that desk and the Lord just prompted me to go over there. And I said, hey, I, I want to say something to you. I've been watching you for the last hour or half hour. And I said, you've been doing a very good job. And your boss should be very proud of you. Because I've been watching you. And that man over there is a total jerk, what he just said. That's total lies. And that girl looked at me and her face just lit up. I thought she was going to start crying, but you know what? (laughs) I had the opportunity to edify, comfort, and exhort Mm. someone. And wherever you are is your ministry. To speak a word of kindness, of goodness, and let the light of Christ shine through you. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about what's going to happen. We already know what's coming. We know what's coming, but God is with us and he will fight for us. So Karen, do you have anything you'd like to add? We're almost at our limit here. No, that's that's a really good word. As you said, Rick, that's the little bit that we can do wherever we are. We can make somebody else's day a little bit better. Make somebody else's day a little bit better. Yeah, just be genuine. By letting the love of God shine through you. Mm -hmm. So folks, we're at the end of our service, or the end of our podcast, um, how to prepare for the coming Exodus. Be the best you can be. Let Jesus (laughs) shine through you. And this is Prophecy USA. My name is Rick Pearson. This is Karen Pearson, and we're reminding you that God is in control and Jesus is coming back much sooner than many people think because the Bible says it and it's being fulfilled. We'll see you next week on Prophecy USA. Shalom. Thanks, folks.